So I want to thank everybody who helped put the show together. <laughs> and if I name names, I'll miss too many. But I will name one. <laughs> Harriet asked me to do the show, and my immediate response was, I don't do exhibits. Because I had done a program at the Architectural League, and you know, I knew how much work it was. But uh, I agreed. I had a sketch, not on a napkin, but on a piece of paper. And Richard Sarek made it happen. So thank you, Richard, for design and production. <laughs> Lots of other people, including those who made, who installed it. But uh, so let's begin with. There are four ways you can do design. One is from prototypes, which we see in the Beaux Arts. So if we look at the National Gallery in Washington. <clears throat> I'm afraid to say it's one of my favorite buildings because then people think I'm a Bozart fan. It's just a great building. But there are five key parts to that building. If you go look at any other Bozart building, it's the exact same five parts. Here's the 42nd Street Library. Entrance, grand, great space, grand stair, gallery, for circulation, large, medium, and small spaces. So I usually show this one without the photo, because that's exactly the organization of Higgins South. Next way is from program. So the Bauhaus is very clear. Classrooms, shops, dorm, administration, and how they all relate to each other. Design from image. <clears throat> It's fun when I say to my students, this is the house as any child would draw it. So if we wanted to take a minute now, we could hop on to Google, Google image, put the house as any child would draw it. Every one of them looks like that. Or design from archetypes. What is a library? Khan says, the library begins with a great space where the librarian leaves books open to seductive passages. You take the book and you go to the light. So that idea then generates the building. And here we have Kant's Medical Towers and Salk Laboratories, the exact same form, different designs. Now, Sullivan, Wright, Kahn all say the same thing, but they mix the words up. So form is not the shape for Kahn. Design is the shape. So Kahn was a great architect, which is well understood. There are hundreds of books on Kahn's architecture. He was an important teacher. There's a guy named Williamson who was in Kahn's studio and contacted all 400 students who had ever been in the studio and wrote a great book about it. But then Khan is a mystical philosopher. Khan gave his last and best lecture at Pratt in our great auditorium that we lost right here. <laughs> the middle of the building was the auditorium, which we lost to a fire. Somebody taped it, and I have the tape, and that became this book. But I spent a couple of years editing it and discovered that it was not in this order, but it was a genesis. It goes from joy to touch to wonder. So key quotes are what the exhibit is. The photos in the exhibit are from John Nicholas, Nicolaius who died about 40 years ago, but was very appreciated by Kahn, Charles Moore, other architects. 35 millimeter camera, handheld, no lights, no perspective correcting lenses, so that the photos looked like the experience of the building. Well, <clears throat> when Kahn died, he was famously in debt 
about a half a million dollars, which was a lot of money then. And that meant everything he had belonged to the creditors. Somebody got the state legislature of Pennsylvania to pay off the creditors, acquire all of Kahn's material, and it became the beginning of the Architectural Archive at Penn. They also have John's photographs. So they very generously provided the photographs for this show. So, I recommend the book if you haven't read it. It's a joy. But where to enter? You know, you can enter in a lot of places, but you often start with monumentality. So, modern architecture rejected monumentality. Lewis Mumford said, if it's modern, it's not monumental. It's monumental, it's not modern. Monumental meant Bozar. During the war, why were we fighting World War II? For values. Well, if we value something that much, don't you think we should represent it in our architecture? What might that be? 1947, Kahn writes an essay about the new monumentality, the monumentality of the community center, the hospital, the daycare center. Well, it didn't take long to figure out that was pretty lame. And he, he is a point where the word monumental just disappears from his vocabulary. And he starts talking about order. Rooting arc now, monumentality is a celebration of an aspect of the past that we value and wish to keep alive. But what if instead our architecture is rooted in itself? The school is rooted in what is the nature of school? So Kant called that order. And then he said, let's see if I get my laser pointer here. Can't use a laser pointer on that screen. There we go. <coughs> stopped and just said order is. So how do you describe something you can't describe? Poetic metaphor. So Kant's metaphor is silence and light. Silence is a realm of potential where things reside before they have any form. Light is their coming into manifestation and realization. <clears throat> then he says something interesting. This crumpled mass called material casts a shadow, and the shadow belongs to light. So that all material is light which has been spent. So as architects, we realize where we put the line, it's black. That's where the light is not. That's where the wall's going to be, and that's where the light stops. So now he's playing with his metaphor and real sunlight. But then it becomes material, and then it's this famous, you can speak to the material. And he says, um, you say to brick, what do you want brick? Brick says, I like an arch. You say to brick, arches are expensive. I can use a concrete lentil over an opening. Brick says, I like an arch. So there's about three biographies of Kahn the last one called You Say to Brick, I think is the best. And uh, she used that for her title, You Say to Brick. But my point here is, you might have seen my subtitle was Taking Khan's Words Seriously. In just a little phrase is embedded whole philosophical systems. So, in my editing, I found the beginning was, I felt, first of all, joyous. I felt that joy must have been in every ingredient of our making. Well, there are two traditions. In the biblical tradition, God creates human beings out of clay. They're dead. 
God breathes spirit into them. So spirit comes from without. In Eastern traditions, Taoism, spirit is always already in all things. So Khan is right away with that first phrase taking a major philosophical cultural position. Here's another one. Khan famously began every project with, what does this building want to be? Well, I do a course on Khan and Venturi. We do one week on Khan's philosophy. The whole course could be this one phrase. What's the first problem? How can a building want anything? It's an inanimate thing. <clears throat> but that's only the beginning. What's the next problem? It doesn't exist yet. So right away, an inanimate thing that does not exist is wanting something. He's saying something here. Well, Louis Sullivan says the exact same thing. And when challenged, how can, you know, steel wants to be tenuous in intention. Concrete wants to be squat in compression. And his challenger says to Sullivan, how can steel want anything? He says, of course it can. But it does in dialogue with the architect. So now there's a vision of the architect as a midwife bringing the desire into manifestation. So, the building has an existence will that exists before it's even manifest. What's an existence will? Essentialism. It's an essence. Well, now we're in trouble. Essentialism is not accepted in any philosophical discourse today. And the beginning of that rejection, perhaps of Sartre, existentialism is a humanism. He's not the first one to say this, but he says, existence precedes essence. So there's a major philosophical discussion here, as soon as you posit essentialism. This then leads to architecture's the art of institutions. So when I was in school, we were looking at Bruno Zevi's architecture as space. Painting is the art of two dimensions. Music is the art of time. What's architecture the art of? Oh, space. Does that tell us anything? Maybe it's the art of institutions. Now, institutions, it's a negative sounding word, but schools are for the institution of education. Laboratories are for the institution of science. Homes are for the institution of residency. All buildings are for an institution. If we're judging a student project of a school, well, interesting forms, sexy spaces, functional classrooms, but what's your notion of what education is? How are you manifesting that notion in your design? What's your position about education? So the architecture is about the architect taking a position about the institution. <coughs> so architecture's sources are in the archetypes. So Khan has this famous little parable. School began with a group of people standing around a tree. One of them was talking. And nobody realized it, but later they said, oh, He's a teacher. They wanted their children to have the same experience. What are they going to do? Come back next Thursday and hope the guy will be there? Or the woman will be there? How do you assure that it's going to happen? You make a school with a schedule. Everybody's got to be here at 9.30. Now institutions have their problems, but that's their, where they come from. So Kahn was not alone in thinking this way. Here's Louis Sullivan. <clears throat> Imagine you split open a peanut. There's that little germ in there. The germ is the real thing, the seed of identity. Within its delicate mechanism likes the will to power, the function which is to seek 
and eventually to find its full expression in form. The acorn wants to be an oak tree. He's saying the same thing that Kant's saying. Franklin Wright says, what is honor? Not the rules of a code, but the nature of honor. What would be the honor of a brick? That in the brick which makes the brick a brick. So there's something in the brick which gathers to it redness, squareness, hardness. Mies says, architecture is the will of an epic translated into space. So Kant says, a work is made in the urging sound of industry. <clears throat> and when the dust settles the pyramid, echoing silence gives the sun its shadow. Well, I'm embarrassed that I've written too many books about the Philadelphia School. Um, I, I am working on one on Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> and my idea is that Wright wrote fantastic stuff, but it's not readable. So I want to edit it, make a book like my con book. But Pratt's going to investigate whether or not we can sell books. Um, I, I, I always like to say Pratt was, used to be the one institution I knew that suffered from too little bureaucracy. <laughs> now it's got too much. <clears throat> but I plan to be here a week from Monday, November 6th, to sign books. So I'll email, do an emailing if you can buy them when you get here. If not, they're all on Amazon. And uh, so you probably know this book. It's from many years ago. A couple of years ago, I did another book on Khan, looking at his buildings. And 40 years ago, Mimi Lobel, my late wife, and I did an article on the Philadelphia School. Never got it published. But Rutledge just did it. It came out a couple months ago, a book on the Philadelphia School. So anybody wants to come by in a week from Monday, uh, I can sign books. So any thoughts or questions? John. Yeah. November 7th. Monday's the 7th? I used to make slides until midnight. Then I'd bring them to Dugal to be developed. And then I'd go back at 3 in the morning to pick them up to bring them to class. Now we just do that. There you go, November 7th. Any, any thoughts? Okay, I think most of the food is gone, so let's go back and finish anything that's left. And you can look at some of these words on the wall. <laughs>